What part of your Swiss watch is actually Swiss? It's no secret that the vast majority of luxury fashion brands manufacture their garments in countries like Hong Kong, China, India and Bangladesh, inevitably to keep expenses down and profits high. And though many people's initial reactions to manufacturing quality in such countries is not necessarily viewed in the highest of regards, like all manufacturing the world over, there is good and there is bad. So there is no wonder why as why so many brands are more than confident in manufacturing their products abroad, and we as consumers will continue to buy these luxury goods, knowing that fact. The obvious thing here is, these luxury fashion brands are not labelling these garments as made in Italy, France, etc. However, if the garment was designed and made in France, but the fabrics came in from Italy, we would be confident enough to say that these garments were made in France, obviously using Italian fabrics. And based upon this example, it shows that we have a rough but decent understanding of approximately what proportion of an item should be made in a specific country for it to constitute as being made in that country. So when it comes to Swiss watches, we rightly assume that the watch, or at least a decent proportion of the finished item, is made in Switzerland using imported materials. And most of us have heard that in Swiss law, a minimum standard of 60% of the value of the watch needs to be manufactured in Switzerland in order for it to be deemed Swiss. However, that's not entirely the case. And in fact, the ordinance regulating the use of the word Swiss for watches has more holes in it than one of Silvio Berlusconi's Bunga Bunga parties. Here, on your screen is that very ordinance regulating the use of the word Swiss for watches. Basically, this is the holy grail municipal bylaw that limits what a watchmaker can and cannot do, and therefore constitutes by law what can be deemed as Swiss or Swiss made. However, I must point out that it does state at the very top of this English version that this document is not an official translation of the ordinance. Only the French and German texts are authentic. I did go through all three versions side by side using Google Translate, and they all vary slightly. They are predominantly, practically the same. Let's take a look at Article 1, Definition of the Watch. The term watch means the following. A. Time measuring devices designed to be worn on the wrist. I think we can all agree with that one. B. Devices whose main function is to measure time, and whose movement does not have a width, length or diameter of more than 60 millimetres, or whose thickness measures with the bottom plate and bridges does not exceed 14 millimetres. However, contrary to this, in respect to the width, length, diameter and thickness, only those dimensions which are technically necessary are taken into consideration. So basically, cancelling out part one and two above. Now, here in D, so early on within this ordinance, is where the wheels already start to fall off. The component enabling the watch to be worn is not included. Yes, take that in a second. You heard that right. The component enabling the watch to be worn, so the strap or bracelet, you know, that thing that holds the watch to your wrist, you know, that thing that transformed the pocket watch into a wearable wrist device and they took the watch world by storm, forming the foundations of wrist watches today. You know, that thing is not included in the definition of the watch set out in paragraph one. Though, as you will all agree, a rubber or leather strap isn't so much of a big deal, except maybe for its buckle or clasp, but a bracelet with its many intricate parts and clasp doesn't form a massively integral part of a watch. How does a bracelet not constitute as part of one? I don't quite understand. Apart from the movement, it contains the most individual parts, and in some cases, far more components. You don't book a hotel room to find that there's no beds in the room. It's one of the fundamental reasons why we book a room in the first place. I also don't ever remember a time walking into an authorised dealer to buy a brand new watch for them to take it off the bracelet, for them to tell me that I have to buy a bracelet in addition to be able to wear it on my wrist. So why doesn't it const... Oh. Well, let's not get too upset just yet. I'm sure this can't get any worse, can it? Well, yes, it certainly can, and it bloody well does. Article 1A4 provides us with what defines a Swiss watch in Never Neverland, <laughs> obviously based on what we have left. So that's the watch case, dial, glass, hands, crown, and movement, pretty much. A watch may be considered a Swiss watch if, A, its movement is Swiss. Yep, I think we can all wholeheartedly agree on that one. 
B. Its movement has been encased in Switzerland. Holy shit, so not Swiss at all then. Contrary to A, the movement, like with the Breitling 59, which is essentially the Citizen 3510, or the Tag Heuer Calibre 1887, which is the Seiko TC78, or so many other Swiss watch movements, and even all the Swiss-made smartwatch modules do not have to be made in Switzerland, as long as they are put inside the watch case in Switzerland, as well as final inspection by manufacturer took place in Switzerland, that should be a standard who doesn't check anything before they send it out. D. And here is the next big, and I'm talking huge, car crash moment within this ordinance. At least 60% of the manufacturing costs are generated in Switzerland. Not quite the same as 60% of the final item as most of us would have assumed. And this magic 60% shows up throughout this ordinance. Why is this wording so important, you may ask? Well, let's take a look at what manufacturing costs are. These are the sum of costs of the, all resources consumed in the process of making a product. And its costs are classified into three categories. Direct marketing costs, so the raw materials that become part of the finished product. Direct labour cost and manufacturing overheads. Now, manufacturing overheads is any manufacturing cost that is neither direct material cost or direct labour cost. And manufacturing overheads includes all charges that provide support to manufacturing. Manufacturing overheads includes indirect labour cost. The indirect labour cost is the cost associated with workers such as supervisors and material handling teams who are not directly involved in the production. Two, indirect material costs is the cost associated with consumables such as lubricants, grease and water that are not used as raw materials. Three, other indirect manufacturing costs include machine depreciation, land rent, property insurance, electricity, freight, transportation or any expenses that keep the factory operating. So, luxury company cars to get to work in, copious amounts of hot cocoa, cookies and luxury chocolates, or Swiss chocolates, I guess, to get them through the day while they 3D print off some new watch designs, throw around a few paper aeroplanes and wait for the next delivery to arrive from Alibaba. So, you can already see that a large proportion of the work leading up to the final manufacture of the product can, and nine times out of ten, does exceed the value of final manufacture, and therefore can easily make up all, and a lot more, of that magic 60%. If we take the Dyson hairdryer, for example, did Sir James Dyson in his headquarters in Wiltshire, England, back in 2016, after spending four years and £50 million on research and development before manufacturing the final product in Malaysia, ever say, well, 90% of the money was spent in the UK, therefore these are made in England. No, to the contrary, Sir James Dyson knows better. However, we do have to give the Federation of the Swiss watch industry some credit, as they have made exclusions to what of the thousands of possible manufacturing costs can and cannot be included when calculating the manufacturing costs. <laughs> In Article 2C17, Determining Manufacturing Costs, the following are not taken into consideration for the purpose of calculating the manufacturing costs. A. The cost of the natural products which cannot be produced in Switzerland because of the natural conditions. OK, I don't know of many natural products being used in watchmaking nowadays, and they certainly don't mine anything in Switzerland. Um... They're using watches, predominantly alloy, synthetic, crystal, pla oh yes, leather for the straps. Ah, no, hold on a minute, forget that. B, the cost of the materials that are not available in sufficient quantity in Switzerland for objective reasons to the extent that they are not available. Well, hold on a minute, I already mentioned they don't mine anything and objectively many materials are imported on mass to supply their industry so they are generally available. C, the packaging costs. I mean, what's that in the grand scheme of things? It's nothing. It's peanuts. D, the transport costs. We're not talking big items here, like cars. I mean, a lorry with a standard Arctic trailer can transport 25,000 kilos of stuff. So that's a truckload. Sorry, bad pun, I know. But if we say one watch, box, papers and packaging measures 20 centimetres squared and weighs 500 grams, then that's five 
or 50, sorry, thousand watches that can be transported in one go. If we then say the haulage company charges a base rate of 800 euros plus 50 euro cents per mile, then from Switzerland to the UK, which is approximately a thousand miles, um, drive in one direction with, will cost 1,300 euros. Add to that the ins- uh, insurance, other bits, and let's round that up to 2,000 euros for argument's sake. Then we're only talking four euro cents per watch. Again, it's a drop in the ocean. E, the cost of commercialization, such as promotional costs and after-sales costs. Well, that certainly can be a huge expense, though definitely added to wholesale and retail prices, as we just learned a few seconds ago. It never constitutes as part of the three manufacturing cost categories anyway. F, the cost of the battery... (laughs) Oh dear lord. So, basically, the batteries are not included in that 60%. That's, that's something at least to be reassured about. Now, we already know that the movement doesn't actually have to be a Swiss-made to be called Swiss-made. But either way, here are some other interesting facts. Definition of the Swiss movement. The movement may be considered a Swiss movement if it has been assembled in Switzerland. Not Swiss-made, but assembled in Switzerland. Great, that's that's something. B, it has been inspected by the manufacturer in Switzerland. That's at least to be expected. And at least 60% of the manufacturing costs are generated in Switzerland. There's those magic words again. Uh, C, at least 50% of the value of the constituent parts, but excluding the cost of assembly, is of Swiss manufacture. Ooh, what does that mean? Ah, well, don't get too excited, because according to Article 2A15, the definition of Swiss constituent part, the following is treated as a Swiss constituent part. A part which was inspected by the manufacturer in Switzerland. And B, of course, the 60% nonsense again. Article uh, 2B16, definition of assembly in Switzerland. A movement is deemed to have been assembled in Switzerland within the meaning of Article 2, Paragraph 1, when all the constituent parts are assembled in Switzerland. However, only, yeah, only, the subassembling of the following constituent parts may be affected abroad. In the case of exclusively mechanical movements, the gear trains. Well, Without banging my head against a brick wall, in the case of a manual wind watch, that's pretty much the whole bloody movement assembled. B, in the case of non-exclusively mechanical watches, basically your quartz watch, anything can turn up intact. So there you go. And finally, uh, for this at least, as I think we needn't go any further, this monstrosity, the case, the watch case. So, a watch case is regarded as Swiss if it has undergone at least one essential manufacturing operation in Switzerland, i.e. stamping, machining, or polishing. What do you say to that lot? The truth of the matter is, there is very good reason as to why the Swiss watch world is shrouded in secrecy. Most of it probably wouldn't survive if they were transparent. Obviously, not all Swiss watchmakers do work like this. Many of those who make their watches in-house do so using all the latest CAD 3D design software, 3D printers, laser cutters, movement making and assembling machines and tools, automated machines to insert and lubricate jewels and gear trains, machines replicating hotorology, black polishing, adding Geneva stripes or perlage with more precision than a human. Basically 90% made by machine. A far cry from the handmade watches of yesteryear that so many watch brands want you to believe they are still producing. Of course, even back in the day, many components were moulded or pressed into shape, but the vast majority of the work was carried out by hand. And personally, I don't mind all this modern machinery if you are looking for absolute precision over the magnificence of handmade. But here's the thing. If watchmakers or brands were to come clean, on their in-house manufacturing techniques and technology, would you still be willing to pay the high prices they charge knowing that only a small proportion of the work was actually carried out by hand or in Switzerland? 
Should the industry change and become more transparent? Definitely without a shadow of a doubt, it would shake things up and make watch brands think more carefully about their customers and culture rather than just their bottom line. If it wasn't for the nonsense ordinance, this would be seen as one of the biggest scams since Bernie Madoff's $65 billion Ponzi scheme. I feel that in this day and age, and for the hard-earned money people are willing to part with to own a piece of watchmaking history, they should know the truth in how it was actually made. The question for now, anyway, at least, is should this stop you from buying a Swiss watch? Well, no, not in the slightest. It should certainly make you think twice about what you're actually buying, because really, unless you're buying it for a real purpose, it's a fashion accessory. And the joy of wanting the item is generally far more enjoyable than the actual ownership. But, either way... What the Swiss seal of approval really means, regardless of where the final product was actually made, is of its quality. You can rest assured that at least 9 times out of 10, the Swiss watch you are buying will be excellent. However, as machining tools have advanced, so too has the quality of workmanship coming out of Chinese factories. It won't be long before one of the major Chinese or Hong Kong manufacturers starts producing watches in the same class. And when this happens, we will likely see the repeat of the effects that the quartz watch crisis had on the Swiss watch industry. Thank you for watching. And if you like this video, please subscribe. Until the next time.